coming up on FaceTime. You know I had the Porsche, the Cayman S in college. Uh, so the Mazda, the that Cayman S. That was back S, in college. How did you get a Porsche as a college student? I had favorable lease terms, and uh, you know I was working a fair amount here, so I earned a wage. So you loved the car so much that you decided to work harder so that you can afford this car, right? Exactly, exactly. You know, the correlation between effort and reward <laughs> is very strong, yeah. and uh, so if you want nicer things, generally in our family, it means you need to work harder. Hello everyone, welcome to FaceTime. I'm your host, Helena Shi. Today we have a very special guest with us in New York, Donahue Peebles III. He's the son of real estate mogul Donahue Peebles Jr. and the development executive at the Peebles Corporation. He's also a recent graduate from Columbia University and a friend of mine since freshman year. I'm very excited to catch up with him and see what he has been up to. Selfie time. As a 23-year-old recent graduate from Columbia University, Donahue Peebles III handles acquisitions and development for the Peebles Corporation, the largest African-American-owned real estate development and ownership company in the U.S. His father, Donahue Peebles Jr., is the founder, chairman, and CEO of the Peebles Corporation. He's recognized as one of the most successful real estate entrepreneurs in the U.S. In May 2009, Forbes listed Peebles in the top 10 of the wealthiest black Americans. Although Don was born into a privileged family, Don's father insisted Don develop a strong work ethic. While Don enjoys many creator comforts, these were afforded through the wages he earned in his father's office and as a basketball coach. Hi, Don. Hey, Helena. How are you? Good, good. We're very honored to have you here today. Oh, please. The honor is all mine. You know, it's, uh, it's so great to see what you've done since college, and I can't wait to share with you and some of your viewers what we've got going on as well over here at uh, TPC, we call it. See, I'm very excited to hear about your stories. Could you tell us more about what was it like growing up with a father that's so successful? You know, that's, that's a really great question, and uh, it's such an incredible opportunity, and I'm so grateful to have been blessed with uh, a family that's been so successful, not only in business, but also, you know, through philanthropy. Uh, my father and my mother, both, uh, you know, board members of the New York Mission Society. Uh, my father continues to be outspoken about political issues that help some of the poorest among us. And I think what, what resonates most with, with me and my family is that success is, is, is a wonderful thing to strive for, but changing the world and changing the communities in which we live in and do business in is more important. And so, you know, as a consequence, right, what we see is, is, is my family and my mother and father setting such a wonderful example um, where I'm able to, to follow in their footsteps and, and create these, these wonderful, vibrant communities. Um, but growing up, you know, they're big shoes to fill. And uh, in a lot of ways, that's exciting and daunting. Um, but you're given such a wonderful opportunity that it's a shame to waste it. I remember when we were at Columbia, I rarely saw you on campus. You were super busy. You were working at the People's Corp while being a student at Columbia at the same time. I was, I was, you know, I was doing a little bit more too, which was exciting. Um, what were you doing? So, uh, so of course I was in school and, and school was my priority, wink. <laughs> but, <Sure>. uh, <laughs> but I was also working here. So my father uh, had mandatory work hours where I would work in essence full time wow. uh, at the company. And I was uh, at the time uh, leading the, uh, the development of Fifth and I, which is an SLS hotel in Washington, D.C. It's actually a great project. There's a 175 key hotel. We're doing 50,000 saleable square feet of condos above it. It's a public private land disposition. So we're actually buying the land from the city and turning it into a hotel. Something I started working on when I was 18 and I'm still working on now at 23. But I was doing, you know, other stuff uh, as well. I was actually coaching at my alma mater. I coached the middle school basketball team for two years at Columbia Prep. Um, and so there was a lot of running around. I got really familiar with the most expedient ways to get to, from here to Columbia Prep to Columbia University. And uh, maybe I didn't have as much time to study as I would have liked. 
You didn't have much time to hang out with friends, obviously. <laughs> oh, you know, I thought I saw you a fair amount. A few times. Yeah,、sure. you know. How many hours did you have to work? Oh goodness! I probably was in the office about thirty hours a week,、wow. thirty to thirty-five,、mm -hmm. and then、uh, coaching basketball took up another ten.、Mm -hmm. So together, they were you know like a full-time job in New York, where you work about forty-five to fifty hours a week,、um, and then of course Columbia took up the majority of my weekends.、Mm -hmm. Graduating、uh, from Columbia. <laughs> yeah, this is this is me at the academic award ceremony. Actually, nice. You got an academic award. See, and you wouldn't have thought I did. Oh, nice. I won the John Wayne Curtis Award. The how, oldest award. How do you get the oldest speech award?、Uh, by speaking publicly well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm sure it's a legit award. No, it is. It is. I mean, it you is. can Google. You know what? You don't even believe. I'm telling you. It's an award. Seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So going back to,、um, I guess you trying to balance your roles,、um, you know, between a student and you know your work here, and then coaching basketball. How did you manage your time? You know, I like to say well,、um, but that's not always the case. You know, a lot of times、uh, the first thing to go was a good night's sleep, and I would,、uh, you know, work here. I'd go to practice, I'd go to class, and、uh, I'd stay up late to finish whatever assignment needed to get concluded.、Um, and I probably wouldn't sleep as much as I should have.、Uh, you know, with that in mind, I think it was a great,、uh, it was a great preparation tool, because yeah, as you get more,、uh, more prominent. And you take on more responsibility in the business world. Time management, you know, becomes、uh, you have paramount importance.、Mm -hmm. And the mistakes I made in college with regard to time management, I don't make now. And the stakes and responsibilities are so much greater that I'm grateful for being stretched so thin for so many years. That now I'm able to to use the skills I learned there to focus on one thing and dedicate essentially all of my time to that one thing. And that one thing is real estate. Exactly. You got involved in real estate at a very young age. Very young. Could you tell us how you got started? Sure. So、uh, it was a family. It is a family business, and it was a much smaller family business when I was younger.、Um, and so I was in the office,、uh, perhaps starting as early as about ten years old.、Uh, before that, when you learn your basic math, you know your、uh, your addition and subtraction, carrying the numbers, etc.、Uh, I learned that on P and Ls. And、uh, when I learned what a cap rate was, it was the same day I learned how to do long division. So my dad would give me the building NOI, and he'd give me the cap rate. And I'd divide the cap rate into the building NOI to find the building value. So I have these old pieces of paper with these real estate word problems, and I did them in crayon. My handwriting's terrible. I got the math wrong, and my mom would have to correct, like, "No, you bring down this number now."、Mm -hmm. It's really cute.、Mm -hmm. um, so it、uh, and it was a gradual. You know, it's a gradual workload in the business. You know, and it just to me it seemed fun at the beginning, and then 13 and 14, I wanted to to learn, I wanted to understand what was going on in the meetings that I was sitting in, and so I would sit in there and I would write down every word I didn't understand. Then afterwards, I'd go around to my dad and the different executives and I'd say, "Listen, can you explain this to me? What does this mean?" Back then, did you know that real estate is something that you wanted in the future? You know, when you're young, you don't, you know, you're not as self-evaluative.、Yeah. You're not as introspective、mm -hmm. as as you are when you're older. And so, when I was ten, it was just this is what I'm doing. I'm learning, you know, I'm learning long division. When I'm thirteen, it's like, well, I'm coming with my dad to work. I might as well understand what's being said in this meeting, you know. And and so, to me, whether it's nature or nurture, I'm not sure. But I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. I know you work really hard and. You just told us that you know while at Columbia you work thirty hours here.、Mm -hmm. You know, like working so hard. Do you have any free time? Of course, everyone has free. What、time. do you do during your free time? I mean, a lot of it I spend sleeping.、Mm -hmm. I also love to work out,、mm -hmm. and I love to eat at nice restaurants. It's a guilty pleasure.、Mm -hmm. It's gluttonous, I know, but I love a good steak. I usually get up early、uh, in the mornings,、uh, especially at my apartment now. There's a nice rooftop deck, so I'll.、Uh, I'll make breakfast. I'll take it up the elevator to the rooftop deck. I'll eat breakfast outside, get to the gym in the gym by about 6:30. I'll work out for about an hour,、mm -hmm. and、uh, you know, then get ready to go to work. And the morning time is my time, you know, to relax and, and for myself. That's a very disciplined lifestyle. You know, it, it isn't if you like getting up early and you hate staying up late. And I happen to be one of those people,、mm -hmm. so it just aligns more with、uh, with what I'm looking to do. As your friend, I know that you love cars, right? I do love cars. I do love cars. Do you have a Maserati now? Ah,、uh, you know,、um, <laughs> still looking at the Maserati. Oh,、so. I know. I 
I'm vacillating mm -hmm. uh, between the Maserati. You know, I had the Porsche, the yeah. Cayman S in college. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Maserati, the Cayman S. That was back in college. How did you get a Porsche as a college student? I had favorable lease terms, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I was working a fair amount here, so I earned a wage, and uh, and that was definitely very very helpful. I definitely didn't buy the car. So you used your wage. You know, exactly. Working. Working to, here to pay right. for the car. Nice. So, do you have to afford everything yourself? Exactly, and that's uh, that's how it's been for for a little while, yeah. uh, which is why I took on that second job as a basketball coach. Mm -hmm. I did have car payments to make, and uh, I bought a luxury or at least a luxury automobile, and I needed to make sure I made those on time. That's very impressive. Oh, uh, you know, uh, I really love the car. Mm -hmm. I love the car <laughs> so much. I'm telling you. So the. So it was a six-speed, it was yeah. a manual transmission, and uh, all the cars that I've had have been manual transmissions. I had a 2001 911 mm -hmm. before the Cayman S, which was also a six-speed, a little bit from what I had in the past. So you love the car so much that you decided to work harder so that you can afford those cars, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, the correlation between effort and reward <laughs> is very strong, yeah. and uh, so if you want nicer things, generally in our family, it means you need to work harder. We're gonna pair, we're gonna pair and fry this, actually. Chicken. I'm making a pan fried chicken. How about not gonna bread it? So it'll be. I don't know how to cook chicken. Do you not? I don't. It's a learning experience for watching. Yeah. I don't like it when that happens. Because that's just plastic. While growing up in his father's company, filing papers in grade school and attending meetings as early as 13, Don officially joined the team in high school as an intern. Throughout his years at the company, he has been the driving force behind the many projects such as the redevelopment of a DC parcel into a hotel. So I think my influence uh, in broad strokes uh, has been the shift to focus on affordable housing and a, uh, a re-establishment of the company in Washington DC, which is where we which where we were founded, which is our home market. I lead the day-to-day -day development of uh, all of the assets in DC. Uh, we have about four projects there currently. Um, most of my day, you know, is uh, I get into work uh, reasonably early. Uh, what time? Course, about 8.45. Oh, wow. I catch up on emails. Um, and then uh, generally it's calls and meetings throughout the day uh, with different sort of stakeholders and attorneys uh, progressing the projects forward incrementally. And then once or twice a week, I go down to DC, I meet with folks down there, our development team members. We have local partners for most of our projects who are on the ground. What are some of the challenges that you faced when navigating the workplace? You know, one of the more interesting ones is, so I've been doing this for quite a long time at this point, but I'm very young. And unfortunately, not only do I, am, am I young, but I also look very young. You too. And so, uh, <laughs> Do people mistaking you as a high school kid? Uh, not a, I hope not high <laughs> <College> school. <student. laughs> I hope I hope college student because they're not far off. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, a lot of times it's uh, it's dealing in spaces where folks you know are 10, 20, 30 years older than you even, and and making sure that uh, you know to a certain extent that they understand that uh, you're very very serious. And then that responsibility falls on me, you know, it's, it's about dressing conservatively, it's about comporting myself in a way that garners respect from these folks. And uh, the great part, you know, about my upbringing, and we touched on this earlier with the ethics and morals, is that comporting yourself with respect, acting as though you're someone who deserves respect, and treating others with respect, garners you respect. And so that has been the most essential skill uh, for me in, in navigating the workplace and navigating what's a, a highly contentious and highly personal business at a young age. You mentioned that, you know, like navigating the workplace and obviously your father has been very successful, but how do you plan to build your own legacy? You know, I always get caught up uh, in this, this necessity uh, or this, this narrative that necessitates some sort of differentiation between the father and the son. Mm -hmm. You know, where they say, well, how are you going to make your own way? You know, candidly, I have an incredible opportunity to honor my father, to honor my family, to perpetuate and continue our legacy. I think there are small tweaks that we can make. I think there are ways for the business to grow and evolve. But in no way am I looking to differentiate myself from what my father's done. In fact, I want to embrace it. I want to continue it. I want to perpetuate it. And I hope that my children feel the same way about what I've accomplished. The building should always grow and change, and 
great businesses are the most malleable businesses. They do what they do well and they grow and learn to do more well, right? Adaptability is essential, but it's not my adaptability, it's ours. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that I think that where a lot of second generation folks or third generation folks get muddled up, it's it's about differentiating themselves, about creating something of their own, and and that's in my mind a uniquely American perspective, because to me, the greatest honor is to continue to build something great for my family, for a collective that's greater than myself. This is me in China. Do my friend take the picture? Uh, no, 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 oh, this okay. is my mom took this. My oh, your mom? Your friend right? took this picture. Oh, that's me a nice in picture. Shanghai. Yeah. yeah, this is me uh, in the hotel at the Mandarin mm -hmm. Oriental. Mm -hmm. This is me at this old water town. <laughs> uh, this is me at the top of the peak in mm, Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, yeah. Chinese buyers are very interested in real estate investments and have been important players in the global real estate market. They invested a record 33 billion in commercial and residential property last year, according to research. What are the differences between American and Chinese investors? What factors should be taken into account when making a real estate investment? And what does Don think of Guangdong's real estate market? There are many different types of real estate assets, but just like there are many different types of investors. And so knowing your risk tolerance is perhaps some of the best advice I can give them. Are you a core plus investor or are you a value add investor? Um, are you looking at purchasing distressed properties in, in high yield areas or are you looking for a safe place to park your money and, and get some sort of yield that you're not necessarily getting in equities or in uh, you know, financial institutions? Um, so to me, it's about matching the asset class to the investor. Uh, it's like going to a, to a shoe store. You want to make sure you get a shoe that fits. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'll be pretty, but you'll take it home and you won't like it because you can't wear it. So I guess the first step is to know, you know, what asset class you are willing to invest in. And then let's move on to the second step. What are some of the metrics or factors that they should pay attention to when making a decision? Absolutely. So for, uh, for income producing assets, what you want to look at is uh, or my favorite metric to look at. Now, folks look at deals differently, but I'll look at something called a yield on cost, uh, which is your NOI over the total cost of the project. Um, and what that does is uh, it incentivizes you uh, to, uh, to develop if there's a spread between your yield on cost and your market cap rate. You've been on business trips to China before. What do you think are the differences between US and Chinese real estate markets? Yeah, I think the U.S. investor um, is generally more risk averse. Mm -hmm. I think they're less accustomed to seeing uh, such big swings uh, in, in cycles uh, outside of Miami, of course. South Florida is an animal all its own. Um, I think that the Chinese real estate investor uh, is more retail. Uh, their, their risk tolerance is much higher. They're, uh, they build for such a rapidly growing economy that uh, it's almost like Babylon. If you build it, they will come. And uh, in the United States, growth is much more stagnant. Take Guangdong, for instance, the fastest growing luxury retail market or luxury residential market in the world at uh, something like 30% annually. Mm -hmm. You know, in New York City, we get 10, 15% uh, year over year growth. That's something to, to, to throw a party at that will never happen again. Whereas Guangdong, you see it consistently year after year. When I was in China, I went to the, uh, the Real Deal conference in Shanghai, and uh, I met with some folks from Country Garden. Mm. Now, Country Garden, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, based is in Guangdong. based in Guangdong, one of the largest real estate developers in China. A uh, $58 billion portfolio, depending on the exchange rate, and uh, that's nothing to sneer at. You know, what they do, which is incredible, which you don't see in the States very often, is large master plan sites. So they build cities around industrial centers. Uh, now, generally, uh, United States manufacturing, despite uh, maintaining uh, a similar share of world economic industrial output, uh, is declining uh, with regard to uh, with regard to labor year over year. China's is growing, and so your industry over there is a big job generator and commensurately a big wealth generator. And so it's driving that real estate market to a certain extent and creating millionaires and billionaires overnight. Mm -hmm.